Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. On my Patreon-supported series of videos, I talk about Norse language and myth with an expert's background, but with uh, a focus on topics that are actually interesting to the public. And as part of that, I have uh, started to take requests from my Patreon supporters at the highest tier, the so-called Air Laws supporters, uh, every month. And then I have my Patreon supporters vote on uh, topic suggestions by the Air Laws supporters. And this is the second video that's being made in direct response to those Patreon suggestions and votes. And this topic is the change that we see in runic writing in Scandinavia, from the Elder Futhark to the Younger Futhark. Most people who are familiar with runes are familiar with the Elder Futhark. This is the 24-letter runic alphabet that you're going to find if you ever Google runes. This alphabet, however, is earlier in use than the Old Norse language. The Elder Futhark, we usually say, goes out of use by about 700, uh, which is about the same time that we see the language that we call Old Norse emerge from its earlier ancestor stage, Proto-Norse, which is written in Elder Futhark. Old Norse is written in the later Younger Futhark, which has just 16 letters and is a much less efficient writing system. One of the biggest, weirdest things about this is that you're getting fewer letters at the exact same time that the language is getting more sounds. So in Proto-Germanic, which the Elder Futhark was designed for, you have five vowel sounds and five letters for writing them arguably six vowel sounds, because there is a sixth vowel letter uh, that we're not incredibly sure of the meaning of, but still, that's a one-to-one -one correspondence, so that's nice. By Younger Futhark, you've got nine distinct vowels in Old Norse, but only four letters to write them, and two of them just write different variants of the ah sound, whether it's oral or nasalized. So what on earth has happened there? Right. Why is it that when you're getting more sounds, you're getting fewer letters? And no one has ever really been able to say why it may be. Um, and as someone who does not uh, try to speculate willy-nilly, I'm not necessarily going to give you a reason why, but I'm going to take you through a little bit of a timeline, looking at some inscriptions along the way during the change from late Elder Futhark to early Younger Futhark, and see if we can't get a kind of a sense of the um, pace of this change, what's really changing when, uh, and how the alphabet is changing relative to the language. So let's start with an early inscription. Let's look at Mikla Busta from Norway. Here we see, and I just want to point out one part of one name on this stone. We have a name that ends in Gastis. Now this inscription is from about the 400s. This is still firmly Proto-Germanic or, or Proto-Norse. We don't have the uh, umlaut phenomena that happened later in Old Norse, where that I would change the A to an E before it, the Z would turn into an R, and the I would drop out, so we get Old Norse gestr out of this word. But notice that this word is normally written gastis with a T, not a D, in Elder Futhark. But not distinguishing between T and D is one of the characteristics of Younger Futhark. So it may already be that in the 400s, people writing in the Elder Futhark weren't necessarily always attuned to the voiced, voiceless distinction between, say, T, D, K, G, and P, B, and might ignore that distinction if there was a way if, if the word was otherwise clear. And of course, after S, you can have, um, you, well, it doesn't get voiced, but it would be, um, it would be unaspirated, so that might have made the sound more like a D to someone. But there we have perhaps one of the earliest traces of a change that does become characteristic of younger Futhark. Now next, let's look at another stone from Norway, the Egya stone. And this is from the last half of the 600s. So we've moved another 200 years, say, past Miklabulsta. And this shows the language dramatically changing 
before the Futhark does. We're still basically an elder Futhark here with Egya, but some changes are happening to the Futhark. But the language has changed quite a bit. So this is interesting. It's showing us that the language is actually making the leap to, from, say, Proto-Norse to Old Norse, before the alphabet is making the leap from Elder Futhark to Younger Futhark. Let me show you a little bit of line C, where we read, somewhat famously, Ne solu sot, ok ne saxi stein scorin. Now, this is Old Norse and looks perfectly at home in the language of, say, uh, the Poetic Edda. This uh, is an amazing amount of change for the 200 years since the Miklabusta stone. Uh, I'm going to come back to that uh, because it's such a surprise. But notice that the runes are changing a little bit themselves, even if the lang language has changed dramatically. We see the old I rune, Ys, used for long E, but uh, the old E rune still used for short E. So, for instance, uh, Ne with a long E is spelled with the uh, I rune, but uh, Saxe the, with the uh, dative ending is spelled with the old E rune. We see a rune, and this is very characteristic of these transitional elder to younger inscriptions, that looks like the younger Futhark H. It's a vertical bar with an X through it, but that's used for oral A in, uh, in some of these transitional inscriptions. In fact, quite a few of them. We see that the P rune of Elder Futhark is never used in this inscription. Indeed, the B rune is used where you'd expect the P. So we have Varb instead of Varp, and we have Keba instead of Kepa, accusative plural of a uh, nautical term. And then we see some shapes that are starting to look more like Younger Futhark than Elder Futhark. The S and the K rune specifically uh, a note look more like younger than like Elder Futhark. So here we have a language that has changed so much. I, I like this quote from Gustav Indrebu. He says, Der eit styra stieg fro mole po tunesteinen, i kring 450, til mole po egisteinen, i kring 650, en fro gammel norse til de ninorske normal mole. It is a bigger step from the language on the tuna stone around 450 to the language on the Egya stone around 650 than it is from Old Norse to the modern Norwegian normalized language. And that's exactly right. This is an amazing change. We have that umlaut change that I pointed out. Uh, we, have, we have syncope. Uh, this is just, it's, it's incredible that in 200 years the language would change this much in one country. So why is it though that if the language is changing that much, why does the alphabet have to change at all, right? There's really, there doesn't need to be a connection there. In fact, you wouldn't expect there to be. English has changed quite a bit in the last thousand years, but the alphabet used is still the same, although in a different quote unquote font over time, but that doesn't really matter. I mean, you can see changes like the S and K changes in the runes as sort of font changes and not really an alphabet change. But it is interesting to note that at the same time that you have this extreme change in language that we're seeing from 400 runestones to 600 runestones in, in Norway, we see similar massive changes and changes of a similar type, uh, vowel mutation and syncope in Old Irish at the same time as Old Irish is transitioning from being written in the Old Oum script to being written in the Roman alphabet. I'm not suggesting there's a causative link, but I think that it is very, uh, very instructive to note that it's happening at the same time. Um, could it be that part of what you're looking at is a tradition of writing that was associated with a generation that has died out at a larger or at, in, in a, at a bigger rate than you would expect? Do you have maybe a generation that's been wiped out by a lot of internecine warfare or a generation that's been wiped out by plague or something like that and they have simply failed to pass on their traditions in a compelling way to a younger generation that's sort of trying to continue, but picking up the pieces and uh, not, not fully understanding the system of their elders. Um, possibly, of course, it'd be very different in Ireland where they're adopting a wholesale foreign alphabet at this time versus Scandinavia where they're just adapting the old one. But I think it's interesting to note that it's happening about the same time. Anyway, Egya showing some change. It's transitional, but it's still Elder Futhark. 
The shapes of most of the runes are still more or less what we expect in Elder Fruit Arc, with a couple exceptions I pointed out. But the system fundamentally is still Elder, not Younger. O and U, vowel sounds are distinguished, and G and K, G and K are distinguished uh, consonants. Now, that is not going to be the case in Younger Fruit Arc, where U and O are written the same and G and K are written the same. All right, so now let's look at our next runic inscription along our chronology, which is the Riba skull fragment. Now, the Liba skull fragment from Denmark is an item that I've pointed out on a couple different occasions in videos on this channel because um, it's one of the really neat places where we see the actual names of Norse gods during the time when those Norse gods were worshipped, right? The Eddas are written down after the conversion, but here we have someone in the, in, well, the, the uh, skull is actually Dendro chronologically dated to before 725, so someone who's definitely in pagan Denmark who's writing the name of Odin. But of course, this is younger Fruthar, so that looks like Uthin. Here we have a skull fragment that can't be more than 70 years younger than the Eggestone in Norway, and we have completely flipped systems and we're in the younger Fruthar now. How does that happen in three generations? Now, of course, it could be happening at different rates in different parts of Scandinavia, but it's still a very surprising fast change. We have some transitional features here. The M and the H rune look like Elder Futhark, not like Younger Futhark. While in common with Egya, we have the rune that looks like the Younger Futhark H, that vertical bar with the X through it uh, that's sitting for A, not H. But it has fully moved into the Younger Futhark system. G and K are no longer distinguished. Neither are E and I, so we have Tuvirk instead of Dverk. We have O and U merged, so we have Uthin instead of Odin. It has completely moved into the Younger Futhark system. So somewhere right around 700, Elder Futhark just drops off a cliff and Younger Futhark takes over. Now, we still see in the Ruk rune stone from Sweden, a stone that I've discussed and discussed with uh, Professor Henrik Wilhelm, one of the world's leading runologists, quite recently on this channel. The Ruk runestone from about 800 actually has some Elder Futhark in it. But this is a younger Futhark inscription, indeed the longest uh, runestone, uh, younger Futhark runestone inscription. But it has Elder Futhark used as sort of a code at one point. Let me show you part of that uh, because it's interesting. What we see in uh, one part is Vari Golden at Kvanar Husli. Now the shapes of these runes are basically Elder Futhark, although there's some weirdness. The A looks like a thorn and the I looks like almost a dollar sign. In fact, that, that I rune may be from uh, the old uh, Ya rune or J rune, the Yara rune. Anyway, it's weird looking. But notice that even though these have Elder Futhark shapes, they have Younger Futhark meanings. This is still Younger Futhark system because the Ruk carver chooses to write G for G and K instead of K for K and G. He's still merging K and G into one rune, but he's just merging it into the opposite of the one that actually lasted into Younger Futhark. Same thing, he's using O for V, O, and U. Whereas in Younger Futhark, it's actually the U-Rune that ends up taking over for all of those sounds. And he uses the uh, D or Eth Rune for T. Now, this is neat because it shows that as far as the Younger Futhark thinking inscriber of the Ruk Runestone is concerned, the Elder Futhark makes like unnecessary distinctions between G and K, T and D, O and U. Distinctions that to us, seem very logical and normal, natural, but to him apparently seem unnecessary. He seems really just to see it as like, oh, why did they write this two ways? Well, I'll use the other one, the one that we don't use anymore, to disguise my message. Now that tells you that the Elder Futhark's system is not only forgotten, 
but potentially just straight up discarded, right? It's not that anyone even, even cared about the efficiency of this alphabet. And I'm not saying that the younger Futhark is somehow more or less efficient um, by design, but it's interesting that, that it has been so thoroughly put behind that there's not even a memory that this works better. Because really, from our perspective, the Elder Futhark is a better alphabet, right? I mean, 24 letters certainly gets you a lot closer to representing the 30-something phonemes of Old Norse than the 16 letters of Younger Futhark do. And we have to take into account, too, that at the same time in England and Frisia, they're adding more sounds also through umlaut, vowel mutation phenomena, and yet are adding more runes. So <laughs> something is happening in Scandinavia, again, right around 700, where the Elder Futhark system is straight up thrown away and I wonder I really have to wonder if it's because there's just a lot of population loss again if you just have plague or warfare that's eliminating an older generation but why does that mean that the alphabet just completely collapses it's so strange to me and uh, I wish that I could offer you a better why but I hope that this video has at least offered you a look at sort of the timetable at which this happens and the amazing fast speed with which it happened. Well, as usual, I hope this has been an interesting or informative look at a question in Old Norse language or myth for you, and from beautiful Colorado in hot and sweaty February, <laughs> I'm wishing you all the best. whole point of this video channel, the whole point of my books, is to bring good information about these subjects to the people who want it, in the places where they're looking for it, online. Otherwise, the people who know what they're talking about are all trying to impress each other, talking to each other in the ivory tower, and they're never reaching out to the public. The people who are reaching out to the public on YouTube or wherever else mostly are scared, angry people sh trying to, to, to spread centuries-old cartoonish uh, racialist theories and, and crazy mysticism that has nothing to do with our medieval sources. I want to bring good information about our real medieval sources straight to you in the places where you're looking for it without an agenda, without trying to set myself up as some ivory tower super genius who's better than you. You can help me do that by donating small monthly amounts on my Patreon. And everyone who does that has my everlasting thanks for your incredible generosity and the way that you help me make a university of uh, my favorite place in the world, the great Rocky Mountain outdoors. Well, from now, from the middle of beautiful Colorado, let me wish you good thinking, good skepticism, and all the very best.